Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Virginia's cattle industry is much more than just a few cows in pastures around the state. Now that spring blossoms are past, gardeners need to let their bulbs recharge. And we visit scenic Wythe County for another county agricultural close-up. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from a cattle farm in Powhatan County. Thousands of small operations like this make up the bulk of Virginia's cattle industry. Ricky Gibson explains how the cattle cycle works. Most Virginians are used to seeing cattle as they drive through the countryside. It turns out that's just the beginning of a nationwide cycle of cattle production that concludes with beef in the grocery store or on your dinner plate. Many Virginia farmers raise cattle on grass for up to a year before they're sold for the next stage in the production cycle. They go to buyers like Margaret Ann Smith of Rockbridge County, co-owner of South Lex Cattle Company and Huffman Livestock. So you can either come direct to a cow, to a buying station like we are, or you can go to a livestock market and then folks like us purchase cattle either direct from a producer or we purchase from a livestock market. Um, we're unique that we do both. We purchase from livestock producers directly and we also produce, purchase from livestock markets um, and then combine those cattle together and then we resell or we retain ownership in those cattle and hold them and send them west into feed yards or other growing situations. The cattle here will leave tonight. Um, they will be sent either to graze into the west, into either grazing operations or grow yard operations where they'll spend in a grow yard, they'll spend about another 60 days. Um, and then they will go from a grow yard to a finishing yard where they'll spend about another 150 to 180 days, uh, depending on the size and weight of the cattle. And then from there, they'll go to the processor where they'll become nice, yummy steaks. Virginia's cattle industry is worth $679 million each year. And that's just the money earned by selling the animals not the other parts of the business. The most interesting part to me and the thing you hear the most is that people don't realize how much cattle move within this country and, and how much we move them around and that even when they go to the livestock market that people don't can take into consideration the next step past once a trailer door closes the livestock market. There's a whole there a lot more steps beyond there before that animal ever gets to the consumer's plate. Smith is a Rockbridge County Farm Bureau member and she serves on the National Cattlemen's Beef Association Board of Directors. She and her family ship cattle to 22 different states on a monthly basis. The prices they receive for these animals are based on national markets, not local sales, and market conditions are constantly changing. We are we have an abundant source of grass here in Virginia, so we're very, very good at the cow-calf operation. And then the next stage is to go to the grain, and that is what they're really, really good at in the West. Um, and there's some other components within that piece that, you know, the eastern part of Kansas, uh, in New Mexico and parts of Texas, there's a lot of grazing operations as well that also graze those cattle to their beggar. Um, especially the conditions we're in right now as corn is gaining in price and uh, very, very rapid uh, price increases. Everyone is looking to make those cattle bigger on grass before they go into the finishing yards. Um, so everyone wants more pounds when they get to the yards to be finished. It can take 20 months for a calf to reach market weight. That's the longest production cycle of any protein source in mainstream agriculture. Poultry, pork, and fish all grow faster. That's why Smith feels it's so important for consumers to understand that the cattle industry is much bigger than just the local farmer. Your customer could be anyone. Um, so today, the customer was, was us. We're the ones buying your cattle. But also that animal is going to go to someone in the West that's going to be feeding that. So that's also the customer. But then the customer at the end point is the consumer. So you have multi points of customers and you always have to be in the back of your mind is always thinking of what the consumer is going to be uh, concerned about or um, 
conscientious, conscientiously thinking of what the consumer wants. Transporting livestock is different from any other type of shipping. Drivers have to get their cargo safely to their destination as quickly as possible since they are live animals. The other piece of this business that we have to be so respectful of is those guys that drive these trucks. They are a huge, huge component of it and they're to be respected and to be commended. Um, and and we, need, we need them and we need to uh, work hard to advocate for what their needs are, uh, especially with some of the legislation in Congress and pieces like that. They are uh, a lot of rules against them um, and we need, we need them because it's not like hauling a uh, freight hauler. It's, it's not the same because our drivers have to physically get in and handle the product unlike um, someone hauling TVs or hauling toilet paper. They, you know, it's not the same. Buyers like Smith purchase all different types of cattle every week across Virginia. From calves born six months earlier to dairy cows that have finished their milking period, all of them are ready for the next step in the cattle cycle. Cuts of beef go to grocery chains and restaurant buyers across the country. Hides from beef cattle are used for leather products and other protein sources are used to make pet food. Beef byproducts are also used in insulin and other medical products, bone china, glue, dish soap, candles, film, crayons, paintbrushes, printing ink, nail polish remover, deodorants, antifreeze, hydraulic brake fluid, car wax, and tires. Nothing is wasted. It's an amazing cycle of cattle production that often starts on a Virginia farm. There's only one part of the cow not used at the uh, harvesting process. The switch of the tail. I haven't found a use for the switch of the tail. It's kind of hard to believe. In Rockbridge County, Virginia, I'm Ricky Gibson reporting. Raising cattle is one of the most popular part-time farm options in the Old Dominion. With more than 1,482,000 head of cattle on 21,880 farms, the cattle industry is the second largest farm sector in Virginia. More than 5,000 of those farms have only one to nine head of cattle. The majority of Virginia cattle producers have fewer than 100 head in their pastures. While local beef supplies continue to grow in popularity with consumers, the vast majority of these cattle are shipped out of state for processing. Hi, today we're going to be talking about what to do with your garden bulbs after they flower from the ground up. Please stay tuned. We're stronger together, especially at this difficult time. For over 90 years, we've watched our membership grow and we're honored to be part of such a special community. Thank you to the farmers who provide for us every day. Virginia Farm Bureau is proud to serve our members, their families, and to give back to our local communities. That's the Farm Bureau way. Gardeners know that spring bulbs need to recharge after their blossoms fade. Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension visits with an expert to learn what should be done from the ground up. Well, hello and welcome. Today we're in Gloucester, Virginia. We're at Brent and Becky's Bulbs and we're here with Mr. Brent Heath to talk a little bit about what you might do with your bulbs after they've flowered. So Brent, thank you for letting us come out today. Well, Chris, I'm delighted you're here. And there's some very special things that you, you should really do for your bulbs to help them to generate new blooms for next season. Well, Brent, you've got a beautiful garden here, lots of daffodils. So tell me, after they've bloomed, what should a, a person do with those blooms? Yes, we want to leave them at least eight weeks after they bloom until they, or until they begin to turn yellow and then cut the foliage. Okay, so, okay. The leaves, the solar collectors, have finished recharging the batteries then. Do not tie them in a knot or braid them because okay. uh, that's daffodil suffocation. Gotcha, okay. So the leaves themselves wait about eight weeks and then yes. you can cut them back. And the blooms themselves, do you need to take those off? Well, for aesthetic reason, you can deadhead, just pull them off. But very few daffodils ever set seed, so that's not necessary for the health of the of okay. the bulbs. Now I've noticed that in this planting here you have some other things planted. Why do you do that? We do. We do have Solomon seal which will follow sequentially to keep this garden pretty the rest of the year. But also the Solomon seal will help keep the bulbs dry in their summer dormancy. 
because almost all bulbs like to sleep in a dry bed when they're dormant, just like you and I like to sleep in a dry bed. Right. So. Okay, great. Let's go, so there's some companion planting here. It really works well. Companion planting is ideal with bulbs. Well, Brent, I understand that they need that they need a lot of sun to recharge. Um, so you've got some trees around here. Tell me, tell me what's going on with that. <laughs> we had the river of daffodils first, then we planted trees because we wanted to extend the season of interest. But the trees are providing too much shade now. So we're going to limb up and try to let in more light. And we're going to thin some of the trees. There are too many trees here now. Now, these are daffodils, and, and I understand how you treat those. But if we go over here and look at some tulips, maybe you can tell us how you, you might treat those differently. Well, Brent, these tulips are beautiful. What do you do differently after they've bloomed? Well, Chris, we typically treat these as annuals here and replant new ones each next year. Becky calls these the parrots of the bulb world. Almost every color except blue. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're amazing. So you just dig them up and you store them? We, if you want to save them, dig them and store them dry and warm during the summer when the new buds develop in, within the bulb. Okay, well that makes sense. Certainly a different way to treat tulips versus the daffodils we saw earlier. Yes. Now I understand you've got a rock garden. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Well, Chris, this is my rock garden, and this is similar to where bulbs grow in nature. Okay. So they're growing in montane areas where they have moisture in the spring, but good drainage in the summer. And then what I've done is I've tried to create a sequential garden. So after the daffodils are gone, I have the phlox and the oregano and the sedums and the thyme and the rosemary and the, the lavender to follow in sequence. Now, speaking of daffodils, what have you got here? Now, this is one of the wild daffodils. And actually, it's proper name Narcissus. Uh, nickname is daffodil. But this is the Jonquilla type daffodil. So it's only one of 13 different types of daffodils. And sometimes people mistakenly call daffodils, all the other daffodils, jonquils. But this is the true Jonquilla, very sweetly fragrant. Oh, wow. The French used to make a perfume out of it. Well, it grows great. wild in, in southern France and Spain and Portugal. Oh, that's great. But this is a Jonquilla type Narcissus or Daffodil. Well, I, like, I really like what you're doing here. And thanks for letting us uh, look around and showing us all the different ways that you can take care of your, your bulbs after they've uh, flowered. And I'm so happy that you came. I like to tell people about it. Well, for more information about bulbs and what to do after they flower, contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley. Coming up on Heart of the Home, grilled skirt steak with a chimichurri sauce. Be sure to stay with us. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends. And then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Now that the weather is warming up, outdoor barbecues are on the menu. Chef Tammy Brawley has a surefire steak recipe to share from the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen, and we're here today with a special outdoor edition of Heart of the Home at Old Tavern Farm in New Kent County. If you hear any noises in the background, um, it is spring and building has started. They're building a new elementary school. So if you hear any loud noises, I hope I can be louder than they are so you can learn today. What's in spring this season? Well, we certainly do have fresh herbs. We've got some delicious parsley. And today we're actually going to grill some skirt steak and we're gonna make a delicious chimichurri sauce to put over the top. Skirt steak, everybody's probably heard that on the restaurant menus, they're wondering where it comes from. Well, on the cow, it actually comes from the plate area, which is down around the belly, which is where most tender spots is. So what we've got is we've got a grill pan here that is, is ready to go. Make sure that's nice and hot. Whenever you grill meat, whether it be at home in the grill pan inside or on your outdoor grill, you want to let the meat rest for about an hour. You want it to be at room temperature before you put it onto a hot surface. The reason for that is because it would stick. So we've got um, our 
olive oil, kosher salt, and ground pepper on our steak. You can see how thin it is. It's not going to take very long to cook. This is about a two to three minute per side process. The second piece is a little thicker. That might take closer to the three minute mark. You can hear the nice sizzle there. So while that is cooking, we're actually going to go ahead and do our chimichurri sauce. I'm going to flip my cutting board because you don't want raw meat on any of these other products. Chimichurri sauce is fresh parsley and we've got a little food processor here that we're going to be using. We're going to pinch off probably about a cup or so of fresh parsley leaves, maybe a little less. We'll see how strong I am. Put that into the food processor. What I have in this little cup is some uh, dried oregano and some garlic cloves. Should I chop the garlic? I'm going to say no because that's what the food processor is for. Add that in. And you want a, preferably a red pepper. These are kind of difficult to find. I did find one at the grocery store. But um, red just gives it a nice balance of color as well. If you can't find the red pepper, that doesn't mean you can't put it in there. Just get a green one. It's totally fine. What you would want to do is get out the seeds and the vein. The vein is actually more where the heat is as opposed to the seeds. Some people don't know that. Now we'll do just kind of a rough chop on that. Not, not really small pieces. Again, the food processor is going to do my job for me. I'm going to just kind of pulse that a little bit. And we're not looking for this to be very pureed. We actually want a nice chunky sauce. We're going to go ahead and add two tablespoons of red, uh, red wine vinegar. We want about a quarter of a cup of olive oil. I'll go ahead and add a little bit to start and then I'm going to come back and add more at the end. Steaks are doing nice. I think the thinner cut might be ready to flip, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Oh yeah, nice grill marks on that. Tell how tender it is by touching it with the tongs. We'll give that thicker piece another moment or so. I'm going to add the remaining olive oil through the feed tube of the top of the food processor. Let it go in kind of slowly. It's a little thick, so we're going to add a little bit more olive oil along with some salt and pepper. And I'm going to go ahead and flip that other steak. Perfect. Oh, smells like summertime in here. Just about ready. I'm going to check my consistency here. Oh yeah, perfect. All right. So our steak is ready. I can tell by looking at it. Put it out on your serving platter or your cutting board. You want to let it rest for a few minutes before you actually cut it. There's the sauce. Absolutely beautiful with that fresh parsley in there, the red pepper, the garlic, the oregano, and uh, red wine vinegar. And now you want to drizzle it over top of that steak. And you can certainly put this in a bowl and pass it for, to your diners and they can add more if they'd like. This is a delicious sauce. It's a little heavy on the garlic, but I like it that way. And there you have it. So we have delicious skirt steak with a chimichurri sauce involving fresh herbs from the garden for the spring. And that's parsley and some garlic, olive oil, red wine vinegar, salt and pepper, and some dried oregano over top of a nice grilled steak. I'm Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Many shoppers think beef can only be consumed as hamburger, stew, or steak, but there are many more beef cuts available at most grocery stores for those who are willing to be a little more adventurous in their cooking. Brisket, chuck, flank, loin, rib, round, and shank all refer to different parts of a beef cow. Each part of the carcass yields a different type of muscle and must be prepared properly in order to bring out its best flavor. 
While certain cuts of beef are good for grilling, many others are tastier if they're roasted or simmered in a slow cooker. If you're driving through Southwest Virginia, sooner or later you'll pass through Wythe County. Burke Moeller visits this rural community to see how important farming is to the local economy. Located in Southwest Virginia at the crossroads of I-81 and I-77, Wythe County has a strong agricultural tradition. The county is named after George Wythe, a lawyer in Colonial Williamsburg who was the first Virginian to sign the Declaration of Independence and became a mentor to Thomas Jefferson. He also helped design the Virginia State Seal. Agriculture has always played a prominent role in the county and today's producers are keeping that legacy alive. If you look at uh, Virginia ag statistics, typically if it's, uh, if it's something that we can grow here so that we're climatically suited for, uh, the land is suited for. We typically rank in the top 10 of those things. So uh, Wythe County is uh, still one of the top 500 counties nationally for beef production. Uh, that's We're going to rank in the top 10 of Virginia, typically top five. Uh, quite a bit of hay production, uh, even though you know the state of Virginia has seen a large decline in sheep production, we're still going to be one of the largest sheep producers. Even though the number of dairy farms has decreased significantly in Virginia in recent years, Nate Akers stays busy on his dairy farm. His 200 cows are milked twice a day, and he also grows crops such as corn, alfalfa, and soybeans. Aker predicts farm consolidations will be a hallmark of farming in the future. Most farms are going to continue to, to get larger in size, but that less and less people are going to understand what's going on with agriculture in the county because uh, there's just less than 2% of the population that are, that are farmers currently. And, you know, we have people moving in from, you know, from Northern Virginia, from, you know, coming from Northeast United States, moving in here that, you know, sometimes they don't fully understand where the food comes from and everything that's involved with it. The sights, the sounds, the smells that are involved. And, you know, it puts a little pressure on, on us as neighbors to suburban areas. But farmers like Acres are up to the challenge. He's one of several young farmers in Wythe County who have been recognized by the Virginia Farm Bureau and American Farm Bureau for their success. Back several years ago, my wife and myself, we were uh, State Agricultural Achievement Award winners. Uh, we went on to be in the top 10 at the American Farm Bureau. And uh, since we've had uh, Matthew Heldreth, uh, he was a runner up this year in the Achievement Award. Um, Sarah Rudolph was the winner of the discussion meet and Jonathan Grimes was a runner-up in the Excellence in Ag this year. So we've got a, we've got a good group of uh, young farmers here in the county that represent Wythe County and the state of Virginia well. Wythe County has a total of 819 farms, over 151,563 acres, with the average size of a farm at 185 acres. The market value of all agricultural products is $65,534,000. Livestock makes up the vast majority of that at $60,018,000. Cattle and calves account for $50,020,000. Milk from cows brings in $8,670,000. Crops bring in $5,517,000. 2203000 of that comes from grains. Other crops and hay bring in $2,000,000. $939,000. Brothers Jeff and Jamie Dunkley have been farming in Wythe County all their lives. They grew up on a dairy farm, but in 2007 transitioned to primarily raising beef cattle. Jeff Dunkley sees more changes coming to agriculture in the county in the years ahead. Of course, I see more and more people wanting to get into agriculture, which is a good thing. and. Uh, uh, it's kind of driving our land prices uh, values up, which is not a bad thing, um, but uh, hopefully they're carrying on some of that tradition and family value of agriculture and passing it down to their kids. And Jamie Dunkley says with county farmers take care of their land and livestock. Oh, we, we care about the land. We're, we're, we, uh, you know, we live off of it, we respect it, we treat it. Uh, as good as we can, you know, it's, it's how we make our living. So. The intersection of Interstate 77 and 81 in Wythe County is a key part of its agricultural economy. 
The highways provide easy access for goods and services into and out of the area. If you look at where we are, um, you know, we're, we're six hours from uh, Louisville, we're six hours to Nashville, we're six hours uh, really to uh, the D.C., uh, Baltimore, Metroplex, if you were really not that far from Philadelphia, um, a comfortable drive to New York City, and then when you go south, we're six hours to Atlanta. Uh, so we fit that mid-Atlantic region really, really well. But the intersection of two interstate highways also creates something unusual, what transportation planners call a wrong-way concurrence. Because 77 and 81 share a stretch of the road, it's possible to be traveling north on 77 and south on 81 at the same time, as these signs show, while actually traveling west. The same stretch of road also shares southbound Route 11 and northbound Route 52. Fortunately, truckers can still find their way into and out of Wythe County easily. And the next generation of producers here is also going places. Matthew Heldreth and his wife Shelby were recently recognized during the American Farm Bureau Federation Young Farmers and Ranchers competitions held last January. The couple won third place in the Achievement Award competition. He's chairman of the Wythe County Farm Bureau Young Farmers Committee, and she serves on the County Farm Bureau Women's Committee. You know, uh, I've been feeding dairy calves since, you know, could walk. That was my first, first tour was calves, and I think that was a responsibility for 10 years before I got upgraded to a, a tractor position. Um, that was my first, um, I guess, uh, unpaid raise. Heldreth recognizes that farming includes risk, but to him, the benefits make it all worthwhile. You know, it's great to see um, a calf that size become a mother and uh, then produce her first babies. You know, it's very rewarding um, to see that cycle continue and to also um, put a very nutritious product in the uh, American food supply. With the decline in milk consumption, dairy farmer Aaron Crogery is looking for alternative right. income options. He's added row crops such as pumpkins and sweet corn and is experimenting with industrial hemp. We've grown hemp the last two years. Uh, the first two years, the market has been very saturated. Um, so therefore there was excess of supply and the demand was very low, uh, which also drove prices lower. Um, this upcoming year, the outlook is that there's not as many people growing, so there may be more of a demand for it in the future. Um, so we'd like to maybe jump back in if we can. And that's what the farmers of Wythe County do best, adapt to changing market forces while still helping a strong local agricultural economy to thrive. In Wythe County, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is real Virginia. For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay